the same. We take authority over anything that is contrary to the free flow of revelation knowledge. We bring this atmosphere under your rule of shape. Have your way, our Father. Heal our bodies. Heal our mind today. Help someone to see you high and lifted up above every situation and every circumstance. Help us to leave this place this morning with rejoicing in our heart that we have not come to meet with a man but with Jesus. We thank you, Father, and we bless you in Jesus' name. Please rejoice as we take your sin this morning. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Let me look at your neighbor and say, Welcome to February. And welcome to church this morning. And if they're looking good, let them know, let them know, let them know, let them know, let them know. Praise God. How was your week? I believe God for you that February shall be fabulous. Yeah. Fabulous testimonies. Yeah. Divine preservation. Yeah. God will show up in all the affairs of your life. Yeah. You will not be left alone this month. Yeah. Where there has been grieving, the hall of joy is released. Yeah. In the name of the Lord Jesus. If there's anyone here mourning, mourning the loss of someone or something, the Bible says that it gives the oil of joy for mourning and the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness to appoint to them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes. I see beauty upon your life in February. The one who appoints will appoint beauty upon your life. The oil of joy is coming into your home in the precious name of the Lord Jesus. Glory be to Jesus. All right, this morning we're starting a, a new series of teaching that we've tagged the liberal soul. As we go into the month of February, it's a month that we celebrate love generally in our world. And we want to turn our attention a little bit to the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. Um, on, on Sunday the 18th, we'll, we'll detour a bit and, um, you know, celebrate love. We, we call it Love Overdrive uh, Sunday. Uh, but... All through the month, I'll be teaching on this subject matter of the liberal soul. The Bible says the liberal soul shall be made fat, and either water shall be watered back also. We're talking about stronger in generosity. How do you become stronger in generosity? 2018 for us, God says, is making us stronger. Stronger. We're going to be stronger in all ramifications, in different areas of life, and we, we, we just want to discuss how we're going to get stronger in generosity in the month of February as we demonstrate our love for God in the different ways that we can. Praise God. I said praise the Lord. So I'm going to start out this morning reading two anchor scriptures which will be the foundation of this discussion. Um, one of the best things you can do for yourself this year is to please uh, you know, stay hooked to the word all through this year and especially this month of February. Uh, one of the greatest things that can happen to any man is to develop the skill to learn, unlearn, relearn. Yeah. If not, you'll be stuck in your journey of destiny. If you cannot learn, unlearn things that are not working and relearn. Yeah. So that you are in the progressive. You're current with the things that God is doing and God is saying. Revelation is progressive. Yeah. And somebody can be behind there was a man that the, the apostles met in, in, the, in the Acts of Apostles. They said, uh, unto what baptism are you baptized? said, unto John's baptism. And then they now explained to him that the baptism of John has passed. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's bring it up to speed. I believe that's what God will be doing in some, some people's life in the month of February. As it brings you up to speed with the things that he wants you to do in your life for his sake. In the precious name of Jesus. All right, let's, let's get started. From Matthew chapter 4. I'll read from verse 8, 9, and 10, and then I'm also going to read Matthew chapter 6 from verse 24 down to about verse 33. This will be the anchor scriptures for this discussion all through this month as we discuss on the liberal soul getting stronger in generosity. Matthew chapter 4 from verse 8, he said, Again, the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things 
I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. This happens to be the third temptation of Jesus. After he had fasted 40 days and was led into the wilderness, and the devil started out with him, tempting him with his physical need for food. If you are the son of God, turn this stone to bread. Jesus looked at the devil and said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, shall not be moved only by his needs, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So the devil lost the war against Jesus' destiny by tempting him with his desires and the cravings that he had. I haven't fasted for 40 days. And then the devil moved on and then took him to the pinnacle of the temple and he said, God has spoken to you that he will give his angel charge over you. He was quoting to him Psalm 91, knowing that Jesus was very astute in the scriptures and he knew the operations of God's kingdom. So this is what's going to happen. If you jump down from here, everyone will see that you are powerful. You know, you, you will be like Superman. Just jump down, bam. And then news will go around town, son of Mary, you know, he's powerful. You jump down from where, if somebody jumps from there, we just, they won't find the person. The person will break a leg, break in the head, break something. But you know you, because you have angels. The devil tempted him with pride, pride of life. The capacity to show off based on the, 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 the things that he had access to. Jesus looked at the devil, said, it is written, you shall not tempt the Lord thy God. And then the final last joker of the devil was to tempt Jesus with wealth. So he took him to the farthest mountain, the scripture says. And I'm going to refer to that again very soon because it's very significant. The farthest mountain. He said, look at all the kingdoms of the world and the glory thereof. Glory speaks of wealth. Wealth. He said, all this I'm going to give to you if you bow down and worship me. If you will bow down and worship me. And that happens to be the third temptation of Jesus. And Jesus looked at the devil. He said, devil, you need to understand this. You shall worship only one God. Him only you shall worship. So I'm not going to fall for this. I worship only God. Nothing else. Let me read the second scripture, then I'll come back to this. Matthew chapter 6, from verse 24. Now Jesus declared this emphatically, having escaped the temptation of the devil, and then can make a recommendation to us based on what he had experienced. So Matthew chapter 6 from verse 24, Jesus said here, No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate one, the one, and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. I wanted to mark those words, the very important words, very strong words. Loyal to one, despise the other. Yeah, you can't serve two masters. That's what Jesus was saying. And from the third temptation of Jesus, he had the opportunity of serving two masters. He had introduced himself as the first begotten of the Father, the Son of God, and the devil says, to fulfill your dreams, you need wealth. You worship me, I give it to you. Yeah. But Jesus said here, no man can serve two masters. It's either you hate one and love the other, or else you will be loyal to one and despise the other. We live in a time and an age where even Christians, like Jesus was, a child of God, are loyal to another and despise the one they should worship. Are you still with me this morning? Jesus escaped it so he could recommend it to us. Yeah. You can be loyal to one and despise the other. So, therefore he said to, he said to him, do not worry about your life. Okay, before then he said, 
you cannot serve God and what? You cannot serve God and what? Just follow me carefully. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. What you will eat, what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. It's not life more than food and body more than clothing. Look at the birds of the hair, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into bands. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? Which of you, by worrying, can add a cubit to a stature? So, why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they do not worry about how, how sorry, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. And yet, I say to you, that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of them, one of these. Now, if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is thrown into the heaven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For after these things, the Gentiles, people who don't know God, seek after. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first. What? I cannot hear you very well. Say, but seek first. 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 The kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow. For tomorrow will worry about its own. Sufficient for the day is its trouble. The Lord bless the reading of his word. Amen. Say better, amen. amen. When the devil told Jesus, all these things I'm going to give to you if you bow down and worship me, it was not an empty promise. If it was an empty promise, it would not have been categorized as a temptation. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying. Yeah, very good example of what I'm talking about. If I tell this brother right here, that if you stand on your head, I'll give you a billion naira. You'll be silly to do so because I don't have a billion naira. <laughs> yeah. It's not, it's not supposed to be a temptation for you. Yeah. Especially if you know me. <laughs> <laughs> but if I say right now that if you stand on your head, maybe you really are in dire need of money, I'll, I'll give you 10,000 naira. It becomes a temptation. Because I can count that to you from my wallet right now. Just give you. So what the devil said to Jesus was a temptation. When Adam sold out to the devil, the devil, according to the scriptures, became the God of this world. <laughs> yeah. Who has a measure of control over the movement of wealth, movement of money and resources. So when he said, I'm going to give you all these things, Jesus knew that he had the capacity to do it. You know, some people have said severally, oh, how come uh, some of the richest people in the world, they are not uh, spirit-filled Christians, they are not believers, and da, 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 and you, you come to church all the time. And See, wealth is free for everybody. The proof of God's presence in your life is no money. Yeah, it's no money. Anybody can have money. Yeah. Anybody at all can have money. Anyone with common sense can make money. Anyone with the devil's backing will even make more. Because the devil needs the money to fulfill his agenda. I don't know if you're getting me this morning. So the proof of God's presence in your life is not money. Yeah. It's righteousness. Right standing. Right living. Grace. That's the proof of his divine presence. Yeah. The oil of joy. That you can still be saved even when all the money is gone. That's the proof of his presence. Knowing that there's more where that one came from. And this money is not your God. Your God is still God. <laughs> Somebody still with me today. Yeah, that's the real proof of his divine presence. Yeah. That was what happened in the life of Job. Everything gone. And Job said, dude, he slays me. Yet I will still worship him. Because my God, he said, I know that my Redeemer lives. 
And it's the proof that it's alive is not whether I still have wealth or still have children and all those things or not. Are you still with me today? Glory be to Jesus. So, Jesus had this encounter with the devil and with all the promise and everything that the devil brought, Jesus focused on one thing. The honor of God, the worship of God. The worship of God. And the honor that belongs to God. And he stayed there. And then in Matthew 6 and 33 here, Jesus said, seek first, first, first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added to you. The big question this morning, Elevation Church, listen to me, everyone watching online. The big question this morning is which kingdom are you seeking? Because if you don't ask yourself this question, you won't be able to get into the groove of what I'm talking about this morning. Which kingdom are you seeking? Let me unpack kingdom a little bit. Kingdom speaks of the domain of authority, a domain of influence, and there are specifics when it comes to kingdom. One, there's a king. Two, there's a, there's a sphere of influence of the king. Three, there's a constitution that binds everyone that lives within that sphere of dominion. So they are called the subjects of the king. And number four, there is an agenda for the kingdom. Yeah. And everyone, from the king to the subject, they lead to protect the agenda of the kingdom. I will say together. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. It's very simple. Yeah. That's a concept of a kingdom. When Jesus said, that you seek the kingdom of God. It's saying, seek to understand the agenda of the kingdom. Seek to reckon with the king as your king and nothing else. Seek and pursue relevance as a subject of the kingdom. Pursue relevance as a subject of the kingdom. Because every kingdom has an agenda. Every kingdom has an agenda. And when it comes to the issue of kingdom, you can't sit on the fence. It's either you are in this kingdom or that kingdom. The funny thing today is that there are many Christians who profess to be in the kingdom, but their allegiance is to another kingdom. Glory be to Jesus. So every kingdom has an agenda. So there are different agendas in our world today, and I want to unpack that a little bit. So you need to understand that your resources, energy, time, money, will go into funding one of them by design or by default. Yeah. My admonition this morning is that you choose to live by design, not by default. Yeah. So that you know which kingdom you belong, which agenda you want to use your time, your resources to, you know, to back. It's very simple. Very simple. So, the dis- different agendas or different, you know, different agendas in the world. One, God's kingdom agenda. Jesus was very, you know, plain, straight to the point about the agenda of God's kingdom. you find it in what we call the Great Commission, Matthew 28 from verse 19 and 20. Straightforward, kingdom agenda. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you and I'm with you even to the end of the age. Simple, straightforward. That's the agenda of the kingdom. The agenda of the kingdom is to populate the kingdom of God by bringing men into divine alignment with God, bringing men into repentance, training them to become disciples, helping them to discover God's purpose for their lives so that they can pursue it, so they are enlisted as a minister, as one that carries the interests of God's kingdom. And then they eventually enlist more people because now they're part of the soldier in the army of the Lord. 
That's the kingdom agenda. To rescue a home from destruction. To rule over a city. Jesus spoke concerning specific cities. He spoke concerning Tyre and Sidon, for instance. He said, if the, the, the is it Bethsaida I spoke about, he said, if the miracle that happened here has happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, he said they would have repented. And he cursed the city because he said, look, this city is not responding to kingdom agenda. So a city can be on the other side of an agenda. A whole nation, Israel, from time to time, will go away from God's agenda and God will punish them and then bring them back to his agenda. Maybe after a whole generation. God is very strict about his agenda. That's why Jesus will speak seriously about the kingdom, the kingdom, the ki and there are many parables about the kingdom. The kingdom of God is like, you know, a man puts uh, uh, the, 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 the leaven in the dough and then it consumes everything and was talking about how the kingdom of God is supposed to consume and take over. The kingdom of God is not, it's not, it's not you know, peripheral to uh, the world. The world goes around the kingdom, not the other way around. We're not follow, follow. I hope you understand what I'm saying. The kingdom is the main thing. Jesus was, you know, very straightforward about the kingdom agenda. And the Bible is replete, especially in the New Testament, about the agenda. In the Old Testament, you see it as you trace how God dealt with Israel. You see the kingdom agenda. Secondly, there's a devil's agenda. The devil's agenda, and it's very straightforward. John 10, 10, Jesus gave us an inkling into the devil's agenda. He said, Satan has come to kill, to steal, and to destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it in abundance. The agenda of the devil is to steal joy, to break a home, to destroy a life, to steal peace, and to bring men into destruction because he needs company in hell. Yeah. That's the agenda. And this agenda is, you know, propagated through different means. There's a, there's a sexual orientation agenda. There's the economic agenda to keep as many as possible in poverty. Yeah. So that they cannot see the light. There are so many, all kinds of agenda. There is alternative religion agenda. The devil has all kinds. And every amount of resource, you know, go into fulfilling all these agendas all around the world. People with billions of dollars and pounds selling who fulfill these agendas because that's what they live for. Thirdly, there's a self agenda. It's very dangerous. It's very dangerous because it's subtle. You see, kingdom agenda is straightforward. The devil's agenda is straightforward. Except you don't know the devil. His agenda is straightforward. But the self agenda makes you feel like you are a very reasonable human being. You have sense. <laughs> yeah. So it, that's why I it said it's very subtle. And you feel like I have the right to enjoy my life, enjoy my time, enjoy my resources. I mean, I did not offend anybody. Which one is my own? You know, that kind of mindset. That self agenda. The only thing is that self agenda is very dangerous. It has a way of coming over and above kingdom agenda in your life. And the great commandment they has Jesus, which is the greatest of all the commandments. Jesus said, you will love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your might. Then you will love your neighbor as yourself. So God is not against self-love or self-agenda. It's just that there's still one agenda that is over and above it. Neither is God against helping my neighbor and being benevolent and being charitable. It's just that there's one agenda that is over and above it. Because we also live in a time and an age where charitable deeds have come over and above kingdom agenda. Because charitable deeds will preserve the body of a man. But only kingdom agenda will rescue the soul of humanity. Yeah. 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 There's no amount of goodness that can make someone who doesn't know Jesus to all of a sudden just make heaven without 
the charitable deed accompanied with kingdom agenda, which is to save the soul of man. What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? That's what the scripture says. Love the Lord your God. That's first and foremost. Love your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, that's what Jesus recommends. Yeah, Matthew 22 and 37. Glory be to Jesus. So the self agenda is very subtle. I love myself. I should enjoy my resources. Nice car, nice house, you know, nice babe, nice man, tall, dark, and handsome, nice bag, you know, nice shoes, all the products of this world. Yeah, and all that. I know some people are looking at my shoes too and saying, it's part of the agenda. <laughs> Glory be to Jesus. The only thing is that before I put my, my foot into these shoes, my foot are already in the kingdom. When they open the register in heaven, they see my resources, they see my time, my money, in the proportion that brings honor to my king. Yeah. Glory be to Jesus. I said, Glory be to Jesus. And the proportion that brings honor to my king. You see, when I started from uh, the temptation of Jesus in Matthew chapter 4, I said the devil took him to the highest mountain. And he said to him, he said, you know, I'll take you to the highest mountain. And he, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory, the wealth thereof. And he said, I'll give this to you. Yeah, I'll give everything to you if you fall down and worship me. It was supposed to be a self-agenda for self-preservation and self-aggrandizement for Jesus to own everything. But it's going to be at a very great price, which is who you worship. Jesus said, ah, it's not that bad. I cannot, because of money, worship you. So it is written. Thou shalt worship only your God, and him only you will serve. I'm not doing. That's what Jesus said. Yeah. In my own words, I know do. Yeah. Simple. Because that was how the devil started. The devil started with a personal agenda. Look at Isaiah 14 when you read from verse 12. Isaiah 14 from verse 12. Personal agenda, in current day terms, you can call it secular humanism. You can Google that and read about secular humanism. Secular humanism believes a man doesn't need a God and he can run the affairs of his life. The wisest man that ever lived in the book of Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, he said, in all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean on, on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. Secular humanism says, you don't need all that. You can sort yourself out. Your brain is big enough to control your life. You, are, you can be a god to yourself. That's it. And then you have a personal agenda, a self-agenda to self-propagate and self-impose. So you are more important than any other thing. You are more important than church, than God, than anything. Yeah. And some people are saying, ah, no, pastor, it's not like that. Too. But you know the truth? I want to bring you to a point where you actually take serious account and know what is actually important to you and which agenda you are fulfilling. It's very important. The devil started with self-agenda, then he became the devil. His name used to be Lucifer, one of the archangels, the most senior of them, yeah, in charge of worship. It was like, you know, the one in charge of everybody. And this was what happened. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 and 15. He said, How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations. For you have said in your heart, save agenda, in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest side of the north. That looks like where he took the Jesus to show him everything. On the farthest side of the north, 
I will ascend above the heights of the cloud. I will be like who? That was when God said, okay, you have tried. <laughs> now we know your agenda. Oh, I'm going to come against this self agenda. See, when self agenda is taken to a particular height, you become God to yourself. Everything is about you. You are the lion of the tribe of your house. Yeah. You don't only call the shot, you take the shot. And if anything is on your way, you can kick it out. On your own. You don't, you don't have to pray about anything. Yeah. That's when self agenda has become very prevalent. Is there somebody who is living like this right now? See, if your mindset is like that, you can't give to God. Why? Because you, God, you didn't subject the making of the money to God. So why were you giving? He didn't help you to make it. So what's the point? Yeah. That's why many people with means find it difficult to give to church or resource kingdom. Because even the process of making the money, kingdom is not there. And kingdom is not paramount in the mind. The things that are most important are the things that other people can see and know that, yeah, I have sense and I'm doing well. And I'm smarter than everybody because it's my sense that give me, give me all these things. Yeah. Have you seen very proud rich people talk before? They make you feel like you don't have sense. That's why you don't have money. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because they don't acknowledge God with anything that they have. It's the work of my hand. You see the rich fool in the Bible, I'm going to get there in this series. He said, this is what the work of my hand has produced. Yeah. He said, so I will, I will build new barns. I will build new warehouses. I will do this. I will do that. And God said, today you will report. You will report home. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. Amen. So when it comes to agenda, unbelievers are smarter than believers. They don't dilly dally about the agenda that they support. They show off with it. They're very straightforward about the agenda and who they are and what agenda they support. We are the ones that are very dodgy about our approach to say, what agenda am I living for? We are the ones that can no longer open our mouth outside and say, this is how I bless God. You know, we have come to a time where some of us listen to me this morning. You can't even say amongst your friends that you give God a, a percentage of your income. Because they will tell you you are silly and you don't want them to tell you that. So, glory be to Jesus. So, what we do is to pander to the whims and caprices of the devil and they, they, to behave as if we don't, we don't have any agenda. Our agenda is to bring the kingdom of God to bear on this planet. It's very important that you understand it. There's a parable of the unjust steward in the scriptures. Luke 16, when you read from verse 1 to 8. This guy messed up, and his boss called him, come and give an account of your stewardship. And he knew he has messed up. So what he did was to say, you know what, if you are owing my boss uh, $100, say it's 50, because I'm going to be sacked. And when I'm sacked, you will help me out. He arranged himself like that. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, it says the Lord of the unjust steward commended him, and he said one thing. He said, the, the children of this world, they are more shrewd in their generation than the children of light. Can you put that scripture up for me so that it doesn't look like I'm, I'm cooking up something? Don't waste time. We're putting it up. Ah. <laughs> yes. I don't want somebody to think that I'm just forming these things. But I don't want you to quote me when you get to your office. Quote the scriptures. Yeah. I'm not saying don't ever quote me, but what I'm saying is that I'm not, I'm not talking. I'm teaching Bible. This is not an idea that I just cook up and I'm just sharing. No, this is scripture. So the master commended the unjust word because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. The sons of this world are straightforward about the agenda. If they are evil, they are bad. A bad boy is a bad boy. Yeah. He won't come to church to come and sit with you. For what? You are the one that will come to church and still go and smoke weed with a bad boy. Yeah. I'm not saying we should not have unbelieving friends. 
We are friends, but our agendas are different. We can be friends, but when it comes to agenda, this is where my own resources are going. This is, I cannot be a Christian, and there's no soul that is credited to my account. Yeah, I cannot be a Christian, and when we trace my balance sheet last year, we can't say this is the portion that resource kingdom agenda. I'm not in that kingdom. Even if I'm speaking in tongues, I'm not. Jesus said, where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. Your treasure follows your heart, and your heart follows your treasure. It's the same way. Wherever your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. If your treasure is not in the kingdom of God, you, you don't have a part in it. They're just paying lip service to it. Just paying lip service to it. This is beyond rationalization. Many people have been speaking, and they're just rationalizing stuff, and, you know, saying, all. Oh, it's... it's very simple. Are you a part of the kingdom or not? Because in the kingdom, there's a king. We are all subjects, except you are your own king. And when you are a subject, your agenda is to resource the agenda of the king and to line up there. Then the blessings and the constitutional provision of that kingdom becomes your right. It's very simple. Very simple. Whatever excuse you give for not being a liberal soul that resources God's kingdom has been an excuse that excuses you away from the integrity of that kingdom and the, the, what the kingdom has to offer. Are you still with me today? It's very simple. Very simple. So, why are you a Christian? Why are you in the kingdom? Some people are in the kingdom just because of the need that they have. Is it for what you can get or what you can gain? So, beyond money, this generation comes to church for what you get. When you make your need too high than kingdom agenda, your need has become your agenda and it has become your God. I know somebody listening to me this morning, you need a spouse, but you need God more than a spouse. So don't make the spouse become God. That need, don't make it become God. You need a child. You need God before you need a child. Before you ever thought of having a child, God has already been a part of your life. Don't come to church because of a child. Come to church because of God. Then the God that you seek then gives you a child. When you put the child before God, the child, your capacity to get pregnant has become your God. Are you still with me this morning? It's very simple. It's very simple because you need to understand what, what, what the agenda is so that you, you'll be able to you know, put things straight. Straight. If you come to church because of breakthrough, breakthrough can become a breakdown. Breakthrough should not be your God. God is God. Then it's a God of breakthroughs. So we seek Him and not breakthrough. Are you still with me this morning? So do you seek God for your petition? Or do you seek God for himself? Do you seek God for himself? You see, there are two ways, principally, that you know which agenda people are pursuing. One, their prayer, the content of their prayer. Two, their account. Those two things. In Matthew chapter 6, I think from verse 9, Jesus taught what we call the Lord's Prayer. And in the Lord's Prayer, it was very simple. He said, in this manner, therefore pray. Look at this. In this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. First and foremost is honor for God. Kingdom, if you are part of the kingdom, you first of all have to say, in my own language, KBAC. Yeah. Our Father, our King, who art in heaven, also is our Father. Hallowed be your name. That's the first. Then, what's the next thing? How is the kingdom doing? That's the next thing. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See prayer. I mean, see prayer. <laughs> and then number three, give us this day our daily bread. You know some people, the moment they show up, bread, bread, <laughs> bread, bread. That's all. There's nothing about the king or the kingdom. It's all about bread. Look at your neighbor and tell your neighbor, is it about bread? <laughs> yeah. 
Bread speaks to your need. Maybe a need for a new job, a need for a car, a need for a, a home, a need for breakthrough, a need for anything. It's not about bread. It's about the king and his kingdom. Say amen, somebody. Amen. Yeah. About the king and his kingdom. It's very important that you understand this. It's foundational when it comes to honoring God, especially with your money. If you don't have this concept, your seed may not even be regarded as worship because there's, it's not conceptual. There's no basis for what you're doing. I don't know if you're getting what I'm saying this morning. So it's very important that you understand this. It's the king, the kingdom, and then me. It's not the other way around. So I said we can decode it from prayer. Secondly, from your bank account. If your money is going in one direction, that's where your God is. That's the kingdom that you are fulfilling. Yeah. You know what? Through last year, there were plenty of Ulabalu online about uh, tithing and all that. The word tithe is not our problem. It only says, it's a, it's the meaning of the tithe, that word, is not a spiritual word. Yeah. It's just, it just means 10% of anything. Yeah, 10%. That's what it means. It's a prescription in the Old Testament. God loved Israel so much he wanted to fulfill the covenant of Abraham in their lives. He brought it under a law that they should give it. In the New Testament, we are not under any law. But the issue is we can become law to ourselves if we are not careful. So, in the New Testament, the early church, they did not deal in tithing. They deal in sacrifice. They took it above. They took tithing as kindergarten of commitment that God was still trying to manage with Israel so that they can remain in the covenant of Abraham. You, <laughs> as a New Testament believer, when you get hooked on kindergarten, your journey is far. Yeah, very far. You will be resourcing other kingdoms and serve agenda and be paying lip service to kingdom. So it's important that we understand these things. In the early church, people were selling houses, selling land for the sake of the kingdom. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be. That's why they could die for that same kingdom. How many Christians of today can die for the sake of the kingdom? It's because our heart is, our treasure is not there, so our heart is not there. Yeah, that's it's simple. Just get your bank account and look at it. See, the only thing you can do is to stop coming to church this month. <laughs> but this word, I will preach it. Yeah, I will preach it. <laughs> You need to understand it. You are not a secular humanist. You are a believer in Christ Jesus. It's either you are in this kingdom or you are not. If you are, there's a concept of honor for Jehovah. As a round of this morning, God spoke to my heart to challenge young people in this church. Many of you will be asked to join the old court. The ones who are already there, Find your way out before fire consume what you are looking for. I'm telling you the truth. This is a word from the Lord. I speak the truth, I lie not. God put this in my heart. And many young people here will be invited to join the old court. The way you make money already determines which kingdom you will resource with it. It's simple. You can't make money through inordinate means and through occultic powers and treat God like an idol that you are peace with small oil and then bring part of it to church. You will incur more wrath on yourself that way. Make legitimate money through hard work plus grace and favor. And then honor God the way God, if it's your God, should be honored with your resources. This is not the word of a pastor. In this church, I've told you before, I'm no more than this. <laughs> if it's about money, I will not be a preacher. Yeah. I had BBC World News came in during the week to interview me about the role of the church in the economy of Africa and all that. Yeah. And the lady was asking me, I read your 
a graduate of mining engineering. So how come they're a pastor? Is it like uh, this place is better than, I was like, better than where? So I told the lady, I said, from my 400 level, I started interning with, I interned with mobile, or no, with Shell. I said I had a ready-made job in oil and gas. Yeah. But I knew from my first year as an undergrad that I was going to preach the gospel. From my first year. So my first year in the university, God led me to start a, a church, a fellowship. That fellowship is still there now. Yeah. It's still there now. Next year, it will be 25 years that I started that fellowship. So this is not all through the five years that I pastored on campus, I never had one naira. This is not about money. It has nothing to do with it. This is a life calling. Yeah. I know by the grace of God, both the word that I know and the management skill that I have, how rich I will be if I'm in business. I'm telling you the truth. This is not, I, I mentor many business people here. I have sense. Yeah. I'm just telling you. So you know. And sense plus favor plus grace. I'm telling you. So this is not proceed. Yeah. There's nothing that God can ask me for that I cannot give. Yeah. Nothing. Giving out cars, giving out, you know, pay people's school fees, anything. Anything. Just say it, we do it. Because Jesus did not live his life based on accusation. He lived his life based on available availability of resources. Whatever I need per time, God supplies. My faith is not built on what is in my account. My faith is built on the capacity of God to meet my need on time. Yeah. Because when your faith becomes built on what is in your account alone, money has the tendency to become your God. Jesus needed a brand new car to drive to Jerusalem. It was made available because that was a car of his day. Yeah, it was made available. He needed money to pay taxes. It was made available. Who is rich? Is it the one that can use money for his purpose or the one that will stack it together and be worshipping it? That is mega poverty. That's what is prevalent in our nation today. That's why our politicians are stealing like there's no tomorrow. Yeah. And they render the nation poor because we are worshipping money. See, in this church, you will see multi-billionaires lying flat on their face worshipping God because money is not their God. Yeah. yeah. That's what we're going to be seeing. The same billionaires popping up like popcorn all over this place. You see how popcorn pop up? Yeah. This is the way to get there when we have the right understanding that is for the kingdom. It's for the kingdom. And we resource the kingdom with our resources. Lift your two hands to Jesus and just bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him. Bless him.